Hi, everybody. Uh, David Terry, I teach Mountain Valley High School, English teacher. Uh, I'd like to thank Q, obviously, the Q board. Everybody was responsible for asking me to be here today. Um, I was a little hesitant at first. Sean and I took a walk on the beach because I do stuff in the classroom and I don't really get up on stage in front of people and do stuff like this. But my message is so important to me that I just feel compelled to put aside my fears and my worries and show up here today. And I hopefully it'll resonate with you in the same way. Um, I also want to thank my district. Uh, they turn a blind eye to a lot of stuff that I do. And my superintendent, my principal, uh, I, I seriously thank you, Dr. Plutko and, and Dr. Smith and everybody else involved in the Huntington Beach Union High School District. I think, like my, thank my coworkers um, for supporting me. They're like my family. And, uh, and my friend Sean, and, and, and all of you. Like, I'm such big fans of everything that you guys do. I steal ideas from you all the time. If I've never said thank you, I, apo I apologize. Um, lastly, or second to last, I'd like to thank my family for uh, allowing me to be here. I, I, I have a son, 14-year-old son. He's a freshman at my school this year. And my wife, she's a kindergarten teacher, which, by the way, kindergarten teachers Oh boy, your, le your lesson plans when you have a sub, oh my goodness, it's like you might as well just stay at school. Uh, <laughs> so uh, anyway, thank you to my wife and my son. And then lastly, I want to thank the students at Fountain Valley High School. Without the students at Fountain Valley High School, the stuff that you see that I share, I'm not sharing what I do, I'm sharing what they do, and what they do is unbelievable. People ask me all the time, they're like, how can you teach high school, the kids today? They're so, and obviously all they're watching is the news, right? And I go, kids today, the kids today are amazing. They are so awesome, they're open, they're listening, they're risk-taking, it's just so incredible to teach nowadays, and I'm really enthused. Sometimes my room, it feels a little bit like a submarine. Right, like one of those nuclear subs where you go into the sub, right, and you're there for like 185 days, right? And, and you just, you're all together and you see what happened. So let's go ahead and let's go on this journey together. I was 11 and a half, I was in fifth grade. I was at school with a really good friend of mine, Sean Zebarth. This is me right here. That's Sean right up there. Sean, wave your hand. All right, thanks. <laughs> While I collect myself. Um, I, I, I had a great life going up till then, and uh, I was at a public school, Newland Elementary, and uh, Mr. Shai's class, who gave you a 50-page research paper, but I still liked it a lot. And uh, after that year, I was transferred to a private school, and it's not a knock on the private school, but I started losing myself pretty quickly. Um, I, I, I didn't feel like I fit in at all. I ended up going to a private high school. Uh, eventually, and things at home weren't going so great as well. A lot of problems, a lot of family counseling. Uh, I ended up running away when I was 15 years old for about a week and a half. Um, I moved out when I was 18, paid my own way through school, and uh, I just, I don't know, I kind of lost myself at 11 and a half. And so it was kind of the journey to becoming a teacher was really interesting. I, I even got kicked out of junior college. Um, so you would think I'm the last person, right, who's ever going to want to go back to school because school really uh, wasn't doing anything for me. But, um, sorry. Uh, so anyway, I get, you know, kicked out of Eden, and I get handed the Ten Commandments. I, oh, my family, by the way, super devout Catholic. They're from another country, right? English is their second language. And so you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? We're going to church on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, praying to God after I get spanked, thanking him for having such good parents, all that kind of stuff. So, so anyway, um, yeah, so I, I, I went to this private school. What was interesting is I found out that you could buy indulgences there if you had the right kind of money. So the rules were different, right? The kids who didn't have money, it was one kind of experience. The kids who did have money, it was another kind of experience. Um, and I probably would have went into a, you think, okay, Terry, what's the really bad place? I think I could have gone to a really bad place, um, but I found the punk scene. And the punk scene gave me a place to be able to vent my anger at the irony I was seeing around me. And uh, specifically, it was the Orange County hardcore scene. I was a straight edge punk. It saved me from um, alcoholism and, and drugs and things like that, which was really great. And eventually, so I eventually I met my wife. My wife really changed my life around. And she, um, so 
Sorry, I was just thinking about meeting my wife. So anyway, I met my wife. She was the first person who didn't put up with any of my crud, right? Like, thank you, women. Uh, <laughs> Every, every time I, I, I have a trouble with a boy student, right, and the mom, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, I'm like, he just has to find the right woman, right? <laughs> so thank you. Uh, so anyway, I found my wife, and, and she straightened me out, thank God. And um, so I, I was teaching martial arts at the time at a school, and the school went out of business, and I was like, what was I going to do? I thought I was going to be, you know, like Bruce Lee or Chuck Norris. And the guys were like, you know, you should go into teaching. And I was like, what? And they're like, yeah, you're really good at it. So I was like, all right, I'll, I'll give it a try. So I told myself, I'm going to be the teacher that I needed when I was a kid, right? And I think a lot of you probably do the same thing, right? You, you're the teacher that you needed. You're the teacher that your son or daughter needed, right? And so that's who we are. And that's what I love about teachers is people ask you, how many of you were a first or second year teacher, right? And somebody said, hey, can you do this? And your answer was... Yes, right? Oh, yeah, I could do that. My, my, the very end of my first year of teaching, the principal came up and said, I need you to be the WASP coordinator. <laughs> Guess what I said? Yes. Sure, yeah, no problem. <laughs> all right, so the slide before was a, a picture of my classroom. I, I would love for all of you to come to my class. By the way, you are welcome, any of you to stop by my class anytime without any warning whatsoever. There's a sign outside my door that says, Observers Welcome. And so stop in any time. But since I can't have you in my class every day, there's just a couple things I want to share with you real quick before we get to the meat and soul of this, although you may find that the appetizer is the best part. Uh, so the first thing I want to share with you is always try the peanut butter pie. Okay, so I had a psych teacher. He said, you always got to try the peanut butter pie. You, you got to try the thing you've never tried before to see whether you like it or not. So I just want you to remember that when somebody says you should try this, you're going to say, okay, right, or yes. People said you should get on Twitter. I was like, dude, I will never get on Twitter. I wasn't on Facebook and, or Twitter until almost three years ago, right? And I thought it was stupid and lame and whatever. And they're like, no, just try it for three weeks. I'm like, no, that's stupid. And I got on and boy, I was I wrong. All right. The uh, other thing that I want to point out is a testable idea is better than a good idea. We get really stuck in our classrooms and our school spaces because we find a good idea and we really want to hang on to it, right? We feel lost at sea and we don't want to let go of that, that good idea, that life preserver. So what I did to actually force myself to kind of try some new ideas is I started a Voxer channel with Eric and John Carippo and who else was in there? Oh, and Kenneth Durham. And it was a test pilot EDU and I said, hey guys, can you just give me some random ideas to try in my classroom? So Eric was like, hey, you're doing all this stuff with writing. Why don't you even see if it works? And I was like, all right, I'll use a Google form. So I used a Google form, and I asked the students. I said, hey, is this helping you at all? And not every kid said yes, but enough that it was like, oh, you know what? I should do that. And then I went and tested another thing and tried it out and got some feedback. It was pretty awesome. So a testable idea is better than a good idea. The other one I want to point out, there's this famous, there's a punk fanzine, and they have this great thing. So... You know how you're kind of overwhelmed as a teacher all the time, right, with all the kind of things you need to do? All you got to remember is this is a chord, this is another, this is a third, now form a band. You do not <laughs> need to be an expert at music to produce great music, right? I mean, the Ramones had like two or three chords and that was it and they kicked major donkey. All right. And the other thing I want you to know Teachers don't have to be good at using tech to use it in their classrooms. They just have to give students freedom to use tech in the classrooms, right? So you have teachers, all, I don't know how to do that, right? There's all these, you know, really crazy stuff going on. And you just say, listen, I just need you to let the students do it, right? And then everything's going to be fine. So here's another example of this, uh, this idea of kind of remixing and just knowing three chords. So there's this guy, Kenny Shopson. And he has this great restaurant in New York called Chopsons. And Kenny, he decided, or he discovered, so he was always making pancake mix from scratch, right? And it was taking him a really long time to do that, right? Because baking is a science, cooking is an art, right? You know that. So Kenny shops and he's like, I just gotta find the one perfect mix. So he found out that Aunt Jemima's frozen pancake batter is the perfect pancake batter. 
I'm not gonna argue with the guy who's had a restaurant for like probably 30 or 40 years. But what it allowed him to do was allowed him to have the time to remix it in all these amazing ways. And as you guys can see, there's some pretty unbelievable pancakes he makes. You do not need to invent everything in your classroom. You can find one good thing and remix it in a lot of interesting ways. Item number five, you've got to make it memorable. So my sister-in-law, Bridget, she was a producer for Oprah. She was a producer for Ellen. She's pretty successful. Um, <laughs> And she, every time they have a meeting that matters, first of all, there's never more than eight people in that meeting. So if they're making a decision, there's never more than eight, okay? Number two, they always bring in some kind of food that everybody gets them buzzing and that it will be memorable. So you've got to do the same thing. If you have, pe did I bring donuts to the Tosa thing? Absolutely, I brought donuts to the Tosa thing, right? When I go somewhere, and if I meet you somewhere, I'm not just going to any regular restaurant, right? We're gonna to go to a restaurant, we're gonna make memorable moments so stuff gets sticky and we remember that for the rest of our lives, right? So you've gotta do the same thing in your PD and with your students as well. So I ask my students, I tell my students all the time, I'm like, listen, if it's not memorable, you didn't do your job, okay? We, I, wanna, I wanna be able to share it out. So they all, they're all working on making their learning sticky all the time. In fact, sometimes what I'll do is a week later, I'll hand out little slips that have all the group names on it, and I'll ask the kids, what did they talk about? And then we hand those back to the groups, right? And if there's nothing on those slips, they didn't do their job of making their learning sticky. That was definitely memorable. <laughs> so sharing is caring. I want you to picture two girls, just the cutest girls, just with love in their heart, looking at you, both holding a heart in front of themselves. Uh, we did this thing where they put hearts all over the school with every single student's name on it. It was really wonderful. And what I want to tell you is, so the reason I took a picture is because that moment was important to me. Raise your hand if you have a cell phone in your pocket. Raise your hand if you take pictures daily at school. Okay, well, I got a good group here. But principals, you need to remember this as well, and teachers and everybody else. You take pictures of your kids at birthdays. You share those pictures out at birthdays, right? If you're not sharing out what's going on in your class, you're kind of subtly telling your kids, this is not, this moment right here, it's not that important, okay? This is not a shareable moment. This is not a take out my phone and start snapping pictures moment. So you've got, and by the way, that means that you've got to do stuff in your class worth taking pictures of, right? And so you got to do both those things, but you got to share it out. The sharing shows the kids. Now they hate it a little bit. Oh, you're not taking a picture. No, please don't put it on Twitter, right? You know, um, but it, they kind of know that like, I thought it was rad what you're doing and I want to share that thing out. All right, IT tech directors, principals, superintendents, and everybody else, you cannot push the technology so far away that when our kids try and do stuff, this is what happens to them, right? We're always worried, what are the kids gonna put online? What are they gonna post? What are they gonna see? What's gonna happen, right? Remember that we, see, we have all seen the F word on a desk. Nobody took the desk away. We've seen it on a textbook. I've seen some crazy drawings on textbooks, right? They are not taking the textbooks away. They see it on the walls. We're not tearing down the walls. We deal with the issue and the problem and the student not the median in which it's done, right? Okay, so don't take away kids' exciting adventures. Now, here's the other part though, teachers. If your principal, if your superintendent, if your IT director is giving you the freedom to do those kind of things, you've got to thank them all the time and you've got to make them look good. If Amy Fideji was my principal, I would make her look amazing. All right, because you would give me the freedom to do that, right? Yeah, maybe. That's right, all right. <laughs> So keep the show's producer happy. Now, all right, so the distance isn't that far, right? So it's good, so the kids can stage dive and they're not gonna get hurt, but that's not the, what we really want for our students is we want them to get on stage. One of my favorite bands was Seven Seconds because at the end of their show, there were more people on their stage than were down below. That is the purpose. It's not you making this awesome show, it's the kids being the show, not a part of the show, being the show, right? So. My students, as you've probably seen in some of my shares, they are the show, right? They're doing stuff all over the place. And you know what? I don't know how it's gonna turn out. And I, yeah, I worry about what they're doing. I absolutely worry about what they're doing. I mean, do they get an OSHA approved ladder to put those up in the park? I don't know, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, but they're doing these really amazing, incredible things. And 
you know, this group right here went, talked to a veteran, made this unbelievable video that you can watch on the little uh, doc that I created for you guys that's all the resources and stuff like that. But it was unbelievable, and it's because I'm giving my kids the space to go out. I don't know how it's all going to turn out, and that's a really good place to be. Now, invariably, here's what happens. I share some stuff out, and everybody says, do you have a lesson plan for that, right? And you know what? There's another group of people who are really concerned with making the right moves, and that's chess players. And there is this Moscow chess club. And in the Moscow chess club, they literally have thousands of years of chess moves. And any game that's ever played, they keep them in little index cards and all these little file cabinets. And you can go there and you can study your opponent. You can find out the moves he's going to make so you can make the right moves. It's all about, we want to make the, like, I want my lesson to go well. So I need to make sure I'm making all the, can somebody give me a lesson plan that steps me through every single thing so it can be the right so this guy, Frederick Friedel, he actually went and he created a computer program that does the same. He went to him, he said, can I pick all your stuff, put it on a computer program, you could have it on your cell phone, and you, you would know all the moves. So luckily we were able to take a look what it looks like inside this Moscow club, and it kind of looks like this. <laughs> That's my file cabinet, by the way that I haven't looked at in three years since I've been on Twitter. Thank you, Twitter. Uh, now, look, we live in a digital age, so you guys know this is not what the file cabinets look like, right? It's digitized, right? It looks like this. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. Russia's getting way more capitalistic, actually. It looks like this. All right, so. So anyway, here is Frederick Friedel, and he's speaking to a chess expert. And I'm gonna, what we're going to share right now is a Radio Lab clip. How many listen to the Radio Lab podcast? It's amazing. And this is going to be about there's uh, the Radio Lab host is listening to a chess game between two chess masters. He's with Frederick Friedel. They're using the Fritzy program to say how many times this move has been made. Chess. What does that mean? It's like his computer can look at the board and say, yeah, that move you just made, huh. that has happened before, and I will tell you exactly how many times before. Hey, <laughs> it started. Here we go. Move one. White moves. It's D4 to D5. White pawn two squares forward. My database tells me that there are 1,775,000 games in which this occurred. Then move two. Black counters with its pawn going from C4 to E6. Now we've got two pawns facing each other, Eight. middle of the board. And according to Fred's database, this exact configuration has occurred in... 514,518 games. So a million and a half down to half a million? Smaller. Yes. Move three. White moves another pawn. 335,000. Black, another pawn. 149,000. Even smaller. Yep. White moves its knight. 114,000. Black moves its bishop. 91,000. Less again. White pawn takes a black pawn. Just have our first casualty people. 2,428 games. What was that again? 2,400. Oh, the black pawn responds. 2,613 games. White bishop flies across the board. 2,125 games. Black moves another pawn up. 1,200. White queen does a little thing. 381 games. 381, getting lower. Yes. Black bishop retreats. 19 games. 19. One nine. White moves another pawn. Which has occurred in 11 games. Okay, black bishop retreats. Still 11 games. White bishop advances. We're down to 10 games. 10. Woo! Black bishop falls back even further. And we have 9 games. Black bishop takes white bishop. 5 games. White pawn retaliates taking black bishop. Still 5 games. And then... White rook and white king switch places. Now there are no more games. You have a position which has never occurred before in the universe. Ever? No. In the universe? Not in the history of this universe. And this is what is known as the novelty. The novelty? The novelty, yeah. And in chess notes, if you read chess notes, you will see... That shortly after this move... The annotator writes, out of book. Out of... Book. Book. Yeah. Out of book. Bye-bye, no, no. book. Bye-bye, book. Which means... No more book. No, no, no. 
Both sides now are on their own. And everyone we talked to who plays chess told us that when you get to that moment, you feel you're alive in a way that you're not uh, normally. <laughs> That's Frank Brady. He's an author and a professor at St. John's. An international arbiter of the World Chess Federation. You're totally in it. Your mind is in some ways not even operating. It's like you're back to being three again. What are you saying? I'm saying this is one of the reasons we watch sports, for these kinds of like, zero moments. A position which has never occurred in the universe. At the same time, the zero is happening inside all of these rules, which are like our lives. And this is what Allison was saying. Games let us experience the world in both those ways at the same time. The Pacers can foul. For example, here's one. 1999. Okay. So I went a little out of book one time, and I decided my students were reading 1984, and I was like, what would happen if all of my students made postcards that looked like they came from Big Brother, and they sent them to each other. So I had all the kids write their address without their name on it on slips of paper, and we all put it in a hat, and everybody drew an address out, right? And then they made a postcard, and they sent it out to one of the students in the class. They didn't know who they were sending it to, right? And by the way, dropping these off at the post office, all these ones from the communist thing, I did have a couple kids tell me their parents were a little concerned about them getting a postcard from the communist party, right? Or so. <laughs> And uh, so anyway, it was a totally awesome experience. And so what I would like you to do right now is I gave you guys all a postcard. And what I would like you to do is I would just like you to write your name and your address, either home or school. It's up to you. And if you want, you could write hashtag fall Q. That's it. You're just going to put your name, your address, and then fall Q. If you have a pen, borrow a pen. If you need a pen, just add. Who here needs a pen? Okay, do we need a pen right over here, a pen right there. Just name and address. All right, once you are done, I want every row to pass it to somebody in front of you that you do not know. And these first row or two right here, Eric and Sean will grab yours and take them all the way to the back. So the goal is to give it to somebody you do not know. So please pass your postcard to somebody you don't know. It's forward. So everybody pass it forward. So everybody pass it forward, forward, forward. Pass it forward to somebody you don't know. All right, the people in the front row, Sean will collect yours and take it to the back. It's okay if it goes sideways if it needs to. Just make sure somebody gets it who doesn't know you. Here's what's going to happen. Eric Seibel sent me random postcards for a couple weeks before my keynote with art on them and little inspirational messages. And it was, ma how many of you remember getting mail, right? From a friend, like letters, like, right? It was, it's magic. So what I want you to do is between now and Thanksgiving, I want you to create a postcard for the person whose address you have and send it to them, okay? I don't want you to do whatever you want with that postcard. If you need to buy a different postcard because you want it to be a little bigger, that's okay. It's fine, I just wanted to give you some material in case you're out of paper at home. Uh, but anyway, I'd like you to do that. One of my favorite things that Eric put uh, on one of his was attempt what is uncertain. And that's what I want you to do in the classroom is I want you to attempt what is uncertain. I need you to teach with adventure in your heart. The purpose of networking, of being connected educator, isn't looking for simple solutions, where it's finding essential questions that you and your students get to try and answer. I need you to just do it, right? <laughs> just do it. If you want your students to write, you need to write. If you want your students to research, you research. If you want your students to innovate, you innovate. You need to close the textbook, close the lesson plan bank, quit looking for a quick one-size-fits-all solution. Otherwise, you are not living in the novelty. You are not teaching out of book. Sympathy isn't good enough. Empathy is nice, but it's still not good enough. We need understanding. Understanding comes from empathy and practice. We must practice what students feel. We have to remember. It is so, I have students, they have six different subjects, sometimes seven if they're taking zero period, they are learning new things in every single one of them, and yet sometimes we balk at learning something new because we feel overwhelmed. 
They feel overwhelmed, and the only way to remember that feeling is to force yourself to learn new things constantly, right? To get in that mindset and to try them out, even if you're not sure exactly what's going to happen. We must dive deep to unexplored places where we too feel the pressure. We want to adventure together. Let's think about Think, Pair, Share here just for a second. I saw some outside the box teaching the other day. So Sean and I, last year, we got the pleasure of going to Scott Bedley's room, and Scott's kids, they are on stage. There are whiteboards around the entire room, right? He made these little tiny whiteboards, and they don't just write the answers to questions, they create their own questions. Scott gives them a topic, they're all up there writing their questions down, he gives them fun little challenges, like they had to put all the questions, they had to include Sean and I in them, and he told them that we love food, right? So it was like if David ate five brownies, how angry was Sean, right? <laughs> <laughs> and this is the, like, look, could his students write anything on the board? Sure, and the other students can see it? Sure, like, yeah, but he doesn't, it's okay, he's in the novelty, he's, he's I don't know what's gonna happen, but it's gonna be exciting, right? It's gonna be really cool. We think of teaching that there's this path that we want, like we, listen, I'm, I make lesson plans, okay? I got a lesson plan, and I want my students to arrive somewhere, to go somewhere, right? But what's fascinating to me is the things that my students remember later, the things they respond to, the things they come up and say thank you for, is every time we step off that yellow brick road, magic happens, right? It wasn't until Dorothy stepped off that the scarecrow was saved. It wasn't until Dorothy stepped off that the Tin Woodsman was saved, right? When we are willing to step off of our path, then the students see like, oh, like that's, that's how we do things in this class. That's how people do things in life, right? We're willing to kind of see what else is going on. So I share all the time what my students are doing. I have this reframe post and they're doing really amazing stuff and I just wanted to share with you a couple things here. So I had a student named Zara and she wrote this amazing article uh, about her friend who had passed away from cancer. And a random woman from I don't know where she was wrote to Zara. She said, Zara, Zara, I'm so sorry to hear about your friend. I found your blog last night after a discussion I was having with my husband. I was sad and upset about the passing of my 10-year-old cousin. She ended her battle with leukemia on April 18th, so I Googled be positive, looking for an image to put on the lock screen of my phone as a reminder to be positive. I found the image you posted and put it on my phone. Today has been a little easier. I also want to let you know that I was surprised to find out that you're in high school, as not only are your writing skills remarkable, your words are powerful. Please keep blogging and sharing your knowledge. You and your friends are doing a great thing here. You must definitely change my perspective today. Thank you. I got to tell you, I've never, ever in my life put a comment like that on a piece of student writing. And I don't think it would have been as powerful maybe if I had done it, but to have this woman respond to my students writing like that was unbelievable, and I, you know, it was powerful, right? Now, am I worried sometimes about my students blogging? Absolutely, do I know what's gonna happen every time they hit publish? No, but the rewards are too great, and I've gotta do it. I have a student last year whose um, sibling was suffering from crippling anxiety. She probably missed about 95 days of middle school last year, right? And her family is just in crisis mode, right? And she's writing this blog, and in it, she's talking about things at home. Right? She's writing to her sister. Right? I don't know what she's going to do but what she's doing is unbelievable and amazing because I'm giving her space to do that and I'm planning for adventure and uncertainty in my classroom. I have, a student, I have students, that, their parents want to share their posts, right, on Facebook. That's, it's just unbelievable, right, that these kind of things happen here. Um, what you decide to spend time on in your class is what your kids will see that you, that you value. So you've got to remember that, right? What are you doing in the class that will show your students uh, what you value? And so what I ended up doing is I used to do this 150 point project and I do the 150 point project and we spent a whole, not that much time on it, it wasn't that good, but then I started doing like idea farming where we spent a lot of time on it and it was unbelievable. The kids were doing all sorts of really cool stuff. I also discovered that competition is not the answer. 
um, because competition just freaks kids out and it gets in bad places. Nobody actually does any better work when they're competing. Uh, that's a fallacy. And so instead what we had is we had an innovation symposium that was unbelievable. And uh, these are kids who actually put on a TED talk, like a real TED talk. Kids, not a single adult was involved. Don't tell the principal. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> it turned out pretty awesome. This is my son on the night when I came back from the innovation symposium. Yeah, right? Now, I get it, right? That's a teacher, the teacher wants him to learn, right? But it's not working out for my son. It's not working out for lots of our students, and here's why. So, I had a student named Julia, and Julia was a 10th grader, and she was the kid, she was an honors kid, and everybody loved Julia. She was in all these clubs, she was unbelievably popular. She'd come into my room, she'd pop in during my prep period, sixth, She'd come by, hey, Mr. Terry, how's it going? Oh, really good, Julie, how's it going? I don't know, I, I walked by your room earlier today and you weren't smiling, I was kind of worried about you, right? And so I just wanted to see how you're doing. Thanks, Julia, you're amazing, right? Middle of her junior, sorry, middle of her junior year, Julia took her life. I, I can tell you story, and I know you have stories of kid after kid who never made it to college, right? And we always talk about college readiness and life readiness, right? Their now moments matter, right? You what are you doing right now, today? What are you gonna do on Monday that if it's that kid's last day, they're gonna feel like that day mattered, right? What are you going to do in the classroom for that? And my, my son had a friend, fourth grade. I mean, there's no time, right? We all think the, the kids have time. They're going to have a... No, they have a now. They have a now, and you need to sanctify the now, and you need to give them the value of the now. I refuse to prepare my kids for a future of suck. This is not what I'm preparing my kids for, okay? There's this great line in the movie where Ned says, do you ever wish you could breathe underwater? And that's kids want magic in their life. Right? They want to feel like they can breathe underwater, and you could provide that for them when you give them space for them to create the magic. I have an adventure plan. I didn't want to go through it, but you can look at it in the resource guide. But one of my favorite lines in here is from Chris Long. And Chris says, experiment. If you're sure of how everything is going to go, you didn't push it far enough. The other thing I love seeing in a lesson plan is what are you doing in your lesson plan that's gonna make that kid wanna go home and talk about it at the dinner table with a smile on their face, right? Put that at the top of your lesson plan and your lessons will get better automatically. So my son, this summer we went to Portland for the first time and we went to this gorge which was really cool and there were all these trees everywhere and they were really slippery and it was really high and it looked really dangerous. And so we, I let my kid go on it and I was definitely worried he was gonna fall and guess what? He fell, and of course his iPod went deep underwater, right? <laughs> it was his favorite moment of the whole summer, right? Because he was having an adventure. We had a night one time where he's like, hey dad, can I eat dinner like a T-Rex? I was like, <laughs> go for it, dude. <laughs> Rachel Deephouse took her students on a trip. I would be terrified to take kids her age they are way too close to that track, right? Like, what could happen? I don't know, but it looks like pretty awesome. Eric uh, Sable, he took his whole staff out for outdoor PD. What could happen? I don't know, could somebody get an asthma attack? Could get somebody who gets stung by a beer? We covered for that. Where's the lawyer? What's the liability, right? But instead he decided we're gonna have an adventure and we're gonna make some magical moments. Speaking of Eric and Scott Bedley, right, they decided to do, what would happen if we had a global school play day? I don't know, maybe everyone will think they're really crazy. What will happen if you actually do global school play day at your class? I don't know, I'm not really sure what, what's gonna happen, but that's an awesome place to be. When we don't know what's gonna happen, we are out of book, we're in the novelty. There's this great article by Grant Wiggins, if you've never read Grant's site, Grant, Grant unfortunately isn't with us anymore, but it's linked in the resources. Um, this was a picture of girls playing soccer. And in it, he tells this story where he says he had trained the girls, he was their coach, and to do all this stuff. And then the game happened, and they were losing. And he was like, just do the stuff that we did in practice. And the girl's like, we can't. They're standing somewhere different, right? 
And so, <laughs> you can't scaffold everything. You have to let the kids struggle on their own because there's little tiny things they learn in that struggle that allow them to be successful. How many times are you going to practice being on the Golden State Warriors on your way to the championship, thank you for keeping it in California, right? And how many times are you gonna practice falling out of bounds in the corner with two seven footers in your face, right? But Curry's a, he's a pickup game player, right? He's just playing, playing, playing all the time, and those are the things you learn. You prepare your brain for the unexpected. How many of you feel young when something unexpected is happening, right? It makes us feel like kids again, right? What's gonna happen when we pour these two things together? I don't know, right? <laughs> so, you know, it's just, it's, it's so cool. So we, if we wanna stay young, we have to do this, right? We have to stand up for this. So I have this student, Emily. Emily hated reading. I never got her to like reading, not for one, I don't even think I got her to read a single sentence. And Emily, in fact, one time we were doing this project about quotes in the crucible. She just Google image search crucible, important crucible quotes, right? And she already found the little picture and everything. She was done, right? So luckily, the thing that Emily really loved is she loved working with old people. Thank God for me, right? <laughs> and so Emily loved to work for old people. And so for her innovation project, and by the way, we did our innovation projects in just 30 days, which I did not think was possible, but John told me to reduce the suck and I tried it. I was scared to do it in 30 days, and I tried it anyway as a testable experiment. She went, and do you guys know the bureaucracy that goes on in an Alzheimer's facility? It is unbelievable. She was making phone calls and emails and meetings and all this stuff like that. I want to do an ice cream social there, right? She made it happen all by herself. She, she went together, she, every single patient had a dietary restriction she went through, she was all precise, she's writing things down, she's reading stuff, like I'm like, what, right? And, and she's wearing a little hairnet, she's got the things on, and she's passing them out, she had little colored napkins, and it was like unbelievable. She even asked them for feedback. Well, I didn't tell her to do that. She just cared about it so much. She knew that feedback was important. She was like, how'd it go? How'd you like it? Oh yeah, it was so nice, you know, everything like that. She came back to me and I said, how was it, Emily? And she said, it was the greatest day of my life. It was the greatest day of my life. The kid who hates reading, who's not getting a good grade doing this, anything like that, I decided to let her adventure, to do something. I didn't know how it was gonna go, and it worked, and it was unbelievable. So I'm calling you, all of you in here, to please start living and teaching as an adventure, and make sure that adventure finds its way into your class whenever you can. Thank you very much, and I appreciate all of your time.